just kind of like the, the pre-show banter. It's fine. It's I could edit it, but I don't know how. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. As often happens with this show, one guest is referred by another guest, and today's guest was referred by Chef Rachel Carr, who's been on the show several times. Her name is Karen Dugan. She is the founder for the Center of Plant-Based Living in St. Louis, Missouri, where a lot of wonderful vegans live apparently. I didn't realize that Susan Benegas lived there from the Plantrition Conference and that I don't know why I'm swaying side to side today but Nathaniel Jordan has been on the show and Rachel Carr and now you're going to meet another one. Please welcome Karen Dugan. It's very nice to meet you. It is my pleasure. Thanks, AJ. I really, really appreciate this opportunity. I, I love this is the best thing about the show is I mean, you know, even traveling all over, who knows if we would have met and I'm meeting all these people that I never would have met and you're going to be making an amazing sounding recipe. I mean, eggplant manicotti with tofu ricotto and uh, cashew bechamel. But first, I'd like to know what is the Center for Plant-Based Living and talk, talk about your other moniker, St. Louis, Saint, is it St. Louis Veggie Girl? St. Louis Veggie Girl, yeah. Uh, so I started STL, well, STL Veg Girl um, back in 2011. Uh, I began a plant-based diet in 2008 after I lost my dad to, to cancer. And then exactly 10 weeks after he passed away, I was diagnosed. So everybody has some kind of really powerful come from, and that was mine. Apparently I'm a slow learn. It took me two times to like really hammer home the, uh, the idea that maybe plants do have a direct effect on your health. So that's when my journey started in 2008, um, and it was a, not until 2011 that um, I started STL Veg Girl. Um, went to the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, did all the training there, did lots of training in between, had my own um, uh, meal delivery service, um, and was also a personal chef for a while, um, and then uh, was teaching a lot of classes here at Whole Foods in St. Louis and a couple other grocery stores and a couple of different outlets. I was service-based. So what that means is I was going around with all my wares on my back, you know, just a big pack mule going from place to place and teaching. And, um, you know, I was, I was laying in bed one night and, um, and I'm also a, a health coach. So I kind of wear that hat too. And, um, I was laying, but, in bed awake one night. And I thought, you know, why do some people after they adopt a whole food plant-based diet and they reverse their type two diabetes and they reverse their hypertension and they lose weight and life is grand again, right? As you know, why does that snowball start to go back down the mountain and they start to incorporate foods that are not good for them anymore. And inevitably the disease returns. I thought, what, what is that about? What is that about? And I came, I just had kind of an aha moment and thought it has to be support. If you don't have support, it's really difficult to maintain the change, right? Even if you are incredibly, incredibly successful. And even if you are uh, an example for other people and they're looking up to you, if you don't have support, it's really, really tough. So I thought, you know, I'm just, there's gotta be somebody around in the country who has this brick and mortar physical space where people can go and get support, get resources, be with other like-minded people, whatever. So I contacted a couple of people in our plant-based world, and I know that you know both of them, um, and I contacted them at different points on the phone, and I said, listen, I'm looking for that physical space that is all plant-based, and I described my business model to them, and I said, who else is doing that in the country so that I can call them, visit them, pay them for their time, pay them for their knowledge and figure out how to replicate that here in St. Louis, Missouri. And they both said that doesn't exist. And I said, that's ridiculous. There has to be a place in Brooklyn, or, or Brooklyn, New York or Berkeley, California that has a place that I'm dreaming up. And they said, no, it doesn't exist. They said, so many people are service-based just like you, Karen, because they don't want to incur the cost, and it's a cost, of doing this. And I said, no, that's silly, because back in 2008, I was scared, I was confused, I was sad, I didn't know where to go. I was, it was a whirlwind. I just lost my dad, I had cancer. What am I going to do? It was not just overnight I thought about food. It was a long journey. So 
that's the whole reason I started STL Veg Girl to be a resource for other people. I don't always have all the answers, but I know where to find them if somebody needs it. So after all this service-based business, I thought I am gonna open up a brick and mortar so people know where to go. Because when you're scared and you're confused and, and you're sick, the last thing you think about is, oh, I have to go look up at the, look up the local grocery store to see if there's a plant-based cooking class. You don't think about that, you know? So it's just a moving target and nobody has time for that. So in 2017, I started saving everything I had. And on the anniversary of my dad's passing, uh, August 13th, we opened up the nation's first plant-based nutrition and culinary education center here in St. Louis, the Center for Plant-Based Living. We were open seven months and one day until COVID. Um, so we've gone mostly virtual, though I am starting to open it back up more and we have live classes here, limited. We're observing all the rules and all that stuff. So we are more accessible to everyone now because we're online, but that support, that physical support is coming back here in St. Louis. And that's what we are. And that's where I am today, by the way. Wow, it sounds like a wonderful place. I mean, I wish I lived closer. It just sounds just fantastic. And, you know, it's funny, I had Colleen Patrick Goudreau on yesterday and we were talking about the same thing. Why people that are not necessarily that have a disease and reverse it, get the disease back, but by people that were vegan, stop being vegan. And that's support thing. It's just huge or just, just the social pressure in general. It really is because again, and you're very knowledgeable about this, when anybody's making a lifestyle shift, whether it is trying to stop smoking, trying to get to the gym more often, maybe we don't want to uh, drink alcohol anymore, or you want to change your diet. Groups of friends don't do that together. Entire families don't do that together. You're on a solo mission. And unless you have some support, it's really difficult to stay the course. And by the way, if you're the person who's going to make the lifestyle switch and change your diet, not only are you different and on a solo mission, you're the weird one. And that really, really is difficult. Yeah. So when did you, oh, are you have you done a lot of cooking in your career and do you love to cook? Um, in my career, this one, me doing this, definitely, yes. But I didn't, oh, that's another thing. I didn't grow up like this at all. I grew up with Campbell's soup, Velveeta cheese, Braunschweiger, bologna sandwiches, you name it. And my mom just was not much of a cook. I mean, it didn't even occur to us that she wasn't a cook. It was just how we grew up. But I grew up pretty much standard American diet. And um, I never even had a love of cooking. And I, I'll tell you what, AJ, when I started this way of eating, I went kicking and screaming. I was in the middle of a house rehab with my husband. We didn't even have a kitchen. Um, I had, I, I didn't have any interest in trying to learn how to cook. I didn't have time for it. Um, my husband was supportive in that he was not saying no, but he wasn't like, oh yeah, go do this. Uh, you know, I, I had, I mean, the cards were stacked against me and it, it, was, a, it was a tough go. It was a really tough go. But yes, ever since I have adopted this way of eating, I have loved to learn. I have learned to love to cook. Nice. Well, the recipe you're going to make today sounds absolutely incredible. Thanks. I've been tweaking it for many years, and it's, it truly is one of my favorites. And I've also, just so um, you know, I don't know if you've had a chance, I have gone in and edited the recipe so that, um, or added notes, so that it can be made SOS free. That's terrific. That, that's what we love is options. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're adorable, and I can't wait to see you cook. Because a lot of people, Brian Croc from Crocs in the Kitchen, woohoo! They're in the house. She says he says not she. He's not she. Karen is the absolute best. And we have a question: Is there a replacement for cashews? Maybe we have an allergy or something like that. Yes, there is. It's white beans, and we'll talk about that. <gasps> nice. I got you, AJ. You know. Yeah, <laughs> you're great. <laughs> All right, you want to get started? Absolutely. All right. Okay. This is, this can be a somewhat labor intensive recipe when it's your first or second time. However, just like anything else, you do it a couple of times, you got it down. No big deal. Okay. Take an eggplant and you want, oh, the eggplant is going to be our noodle for this manicotti. Oh, by the way, yeah, we're making manicotti. Uh, you want a long ish, uh, 
eggplant. And what you're gonna do is first of all, and this is what I do with all of my students. This is not how you hold a knife. Some of my students are rolling their eyes because I do this all the time. This is not how you hold a knife. This is not how you hold a knife because I don't know one person who has a finger that strong that can get through root vegetables, right? This is not a thing. What you wanna do is take your knife, pinch the bottom of the blade, and wrap your hand around the top of the handle. That will give you ultimate control of your knife. All right, you're gonna take your eggplant and you're gonna cut off the very top. You wanna keep as much real estate as you can on that big boy and cut off the bottom just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit. Now you have a flat surface. A lot safer than it really pulling around, right? Absolutely. We call that, I used to teach the blind and that's the stabilizing cut. It's very important. The stabilizing cut. That's excellent. I'm going to start using that. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, this is scary, right? Feel so free. I and uh, and and uh, you can think of me every time you do that. People are saying that a lot of people watching today know you. They love your recipes. So this is great. Oh, thanks everybody. St. Louis. Okay, so we're going to cut off now we're going to do about an eighth of an inch slices here. This also is going to take a little bit of getting used to. So I always say eggplant up, get an extra one. So you're going to take off that, that first one and you're either going to compost or throw away or do whatever you're going to do with that guy. Okay. Now make sure that your blade is very sharp and that you're letting the knife do the work. You're not going to be using a whole lot of energy here or a, lot, a whole lot of strength. You're just going to, now I'm doing this on camera, so inevitably it's not going to be the best. Oh, that one wasn't so bad. So about an eighth of an inch, and of course you want them to be as uniform as possible. If you could see this up close, you would see how ununiform these are. That's okay. I have a plan for you. Now you're going to do you're always going to want to make more, even if you think that you're a super master eggplant cutter, because in the cooking process, when these little guys are in the oven, sometimes they don't cook so evenly and they brown up or burn a little bit. If they cook too much and see this one, no loss. Uh, if they cook too much or they burn, um, then they will become crispy and you will not be able to roll them. So that's why you always want to, as I said, eggplant up. I think we can get one more safely right now. Okay. Now take your, because I don't use any oil either, take your baking sheet and line it with parchment paper. You can choose to salt these if you want. I, I mean, I, I used to, I don't really anymore because I trialed it and I realized that there was no difference after you baked them. So you do not need to sweat them. And that's really pulling all the water out and adding, adding salt to pull the water out. You don't need to. And just put them on your baking sheet. And at 350 degrees, you'll put them in the oven. So I'm going to not really put them in the oven right now because I'll leave those for later because I've already TV magic made some for you. Mm -hmm. And you can see they are very, very flimsy. This is what you want. You can roll this really, really easily. Now, um, uh, Karen, Sherry'd like to know if you, if you could do this on a mandolin, if you could slice this. And Green Bean Cuisine says, I grew up in St. Louis and lived there when I changed to a full plant-based diet. It was extremely tough in that area and lacked support. I think it has changed a lot since then. Are you finding a lot of support for your business? Number one, Sherry, yes, you can use a mandolin. I have in the past, um, but sometimes I find that my uh, my eggplants are a little bit too large, larger than the mandolin itself. So that's why I just always use a knife. But yeah, if you have a mandolin large enough or an eggplant small enough, go for it, girl. And the number two, green bean. Hi. Um, yeah, it's, it was back in 2008 when I made the change. I can remember going to restaurants with my husband every so often 
And um, I would ask now ba also back in AJ back in 2008, and you started before I did. Um, nobody said plant-based, they said vegan. Right. And uh, so we would, you know, sit down at a cafe or a restaurant or whatever. And I would say, what are your vegan options? And here, right in the middle of the country, Midwest, St. Louis, they, you know, people looked at me like, girl, you are crazy. Go back out to the West coast. You know, it was, <laughs> it was nuts. It was nuts. Not only did I not have support and my husband has always been, has always got, had my back, but I mean, he didn't really know what this was about. Um, and not only did I not have support, but just as I was saying before, people thought I was cuckoo. So um, it was, it, yes, green bean, yes, it was very, very difficult. But to your point, wow, boy, is it turned around. I mean, it is, there are plenty of options here, um, both vegan and plant-based, um, but it's, it's yeah, it, it really, really took some time to get that going. It's been difficult, but it's great now, so. Great. And one more question from Stephanie. Any recipe substitutions for people that have to avoid nightshades? Um, you know what? I also use this recipe. Okay, so we're using tomatoes also. What about zucchini for the eggplant? That is a good idea. I would use, right, zucchini or yellow squash. Um, and if you want to do a pasta, you could just do those large pasta shells as well. Now, with the sauce, if you can't do tomatoes, I'm wondering, AJ, what do you think? Like, could you do like a, um, oh, maybe a pumpkin or? Well, you know, there, I, I, I don't have this recipe, but I know that there are recipes for people to make tomato sauce with things like beets and carrots when they can't have tomatoes. I don't have this recipe, but if they Google it, I bet they'll find it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. My that pleasure. <laughs> okay. We've got our eggplant all set to go. Um, let's make, what's the next step? Oh, the ricotta. Okay, I mean, this ricotta is so dreamy to me. And um, again, been working on this for a long time. So it's pretty easy. I mean, every step of this recipe is pretty easy. It's just, there's, a, you know, a few number of steps. Okay, we're gonna take the, uh, the tofu ricotta today, or if you wanna sound fancy, Ricotta. I love it when, uh, what's her name? Giada? Is that her name, the chef? Giada De Laurentiis? Yes. Okay. So she's awesome. Uh, I don't know her. Um, but when she says ricotta, I love it. I'm like, just keep saying it. Just keep saying it. She's ricotta. Ricotta. She's so fancy. Um, I just say ricotta like a Midwesterner. Okay, so we're going to use tofu for this. And I like to glove up because I just don't like all that food underneath my nails. I'm a little bit of a princess like that. Really firm tofu, organic firm tofu. This is not silken tofu. This is just regular ultra firm tofu. And if you can find it in the vacuum pack, even better. It's just there's hardly any water in it. It's great. Doesn't need to be pressed. You're fine. This ricotta has our uh, tofu. We're going to grab everything right now. This has tahini in it. You don't need to use tahini. We'll talk about that. We're going to use um, nutritional yeast, kind of the nectar of the gods there for us plant-based people. A shallot, a little baby shallot, all minced up. Um, let's see, nutmeg, lemon, sea salt. Here's our sea salt. Lemon, we'll get to that in a second. Nutmeg, I'm gonna tell you what a chef said to me about that. And we have our chopped, our frozen defrosted chopped organic spinach. And, and a little, oh, a little bit of basil leaves, fresh basil leaves, which we've already chopped up for you. Okay, take your tofu and just, I mean, you know, don't get in there with any kind of tool. Uh -uh. Th this is the tool right here. Get in there with your hands. And it's going to look like the beginning, if you've ever made uh, the, the uh, egg scramble, this is kind of the beginning of that as well, or tofu scramble. And it's just, you know, just looks like crumbled up tofu. Grab a towel. Now we're going to add in everything else. We're gonna add in the tahini. 
This is gonna help everything stick together. Now, if you don't wanna to use tahini, totally fine. Um, you, can, you can omit it, I've done that before. Um, you just might want to add mm, a tablespoon or so of water just to kind of get that, um, that moisture in there. Or you can mash up white beans and fold that in as well. We're gonna add in nutritional yeast. I'm gonna eye this sucker. Here's our shallot, put it in. We're not even gonna cook it. It's gonna be delicious. A little bit of lemon juice and lemon zest. So we're gonna zest it first. I'm gonna cut the sucker open. Then using a microplane. Everyone needs a microplane, right AJ? I guess, and a zester. Yeah. And yes. an air fryer and an instant pot. <laughs> okay, let's just talk about air frying for a half a second. Um, my husband bought the brittle, finally, and, um, and I was like, oh man, this is, I don't have time to like figure this out. I mean, I've always wanted one, but you know, everybody's busy, right? So I came across your, um, Revel video at where you made the potatoes and you had that crazy potato cutter. Get out. That's, that's a gadget that I would love to yeah, have. That too. is the best. I know it's, it's just, it just, you go boom, boom. Yeah, and boom. Exactly. It's so easy. Even and it works on turnips too. I make turnip fries and rutabaga fries. I love that machine. All right. So now is there a, is there a, um, can I find that on your website? Or That's in my Amazon store. I'll post a link here and I'll oh, send it to you in, in the thank you email. But when, when I, you know, I, I teach now for the McDougal uh, 12 day program. And on the first day, we're all getting to know each other. Uh, Heather, his daughter who runs the program says, I want everybody to show their favorite thing. And that's what I showed because it's amazing. Especially because I'm a, I still, after a year, I still got a torn rotator cuff and yeah. it's really hard for me to, to cut things, especially hard things like turnips. Turnip fries in the Breville are amazing as our rutabaga fries. Okay, then, and then what spices do you put on it? You know, I don't need it. They're so good. But but, yeah. so, but with the rutabaga fries, they taste so much like the potatoes. I, I'll dip them in barbecue sauce, but the turnip ones, I just eat them plain. They're so good. All right. Girl, I would never have done that, but now I have to give it a try. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just everything in a fry shape tastes better, whether it's jicama <laughs> or it's just, there's something about making it in that shape. I'll post a link to the machine I use and I'll also send it to you. Quote of the day, everything in a fry shape tastes better. <laughs> it does. It really, you know, think about it. Kids, you know, kids might not eat an apple sitting on a counter, but if you take that thing and cut it in eight slices, the kid will eat the apple. And we're all just little kids at heart. And just the shape yeah. is important to us, you know, otherwise we'd just be walking around with a potato like this, which I have been known to do, especially if I go to Wendy's, but the it is fun. Just a fry, you know, something about a fry. I am going to have to try that damn machine. Oh, and, oh. and you know, I also make apple, hot apple pie fries at the recipes on my YouTube page. And using that same machine, I cut the envy apple because the envy apples are really big and it cuts it in yeah. perfect fry shapes. And so I make hot apple pie fries with vanilla caramel sauce to dip in delicious. So that I like machines. They make my life easier. You know, I used to, I, I kind of prided myself on not being a gadget girl for so long because I don't like clutter or anything, but I got to tell you, I'm, I'm becoming a little bit of a gadget freak and um, I am going to get that, that fry thing that you have fry yeah. cutter. Yeah. Oh, I'm, look, I'm looking it up right now. Cause sometimes, you know, with Amazon, the price changes. If you have a restaurant supply store near you, uh, I've seen them in those, in that type of store that I think was around $69. So I'm, I'm searching right now and I'll get that for you. Oh, we, yeah. I'm a member of the wholesale place here, so I can give that, but I mean, you know, if it can just come to my door, I might as well just order from your store. And then you get a commission. Well, thank okay, you. a couple of pennies. Well, I, yeah, I know it's not much, but anything helps. Okay, we've added the tofu, the tahini, the nutritional yeast, the shallot, uh, lemon zest, grated nutmeg. I once had a chef tell me that you only use fresh nutmeg. There is no sense in using dried nutmeg. And boy, I tell you what, she was correct. So, and a little bit goes a long way. So you don't need a whole lot. It's not something that you really want to pick up in a recipe. You want to be like, you don't want to think, oh, there's a lot of nutmeg in there. No, it's just kind of a flavor enhancer. A little bit goes a really, really long way. It has this beautiful woody smell and flavor. 
oh, it's just wonderful. And we're actually using it twice, which is another reason you don't want to use a whole lot in one place in this recipe. We're using it in uh, the bechamel, another fancy word, and the ricotta. Uh, okay, a little bit of salt. If you don't want to do that, I get it. You can leave it out. Some freshly ground pepper, lots of that, because we love that. And we're going to add our spinach. Now, um, spinach usually comes in like those eight or nine or 10 little block, dark, or yeah, eight ounce blocks. Uh, I was at Trader Joe's yesterday, got a 16 ounce bag, whole thing, whole thing's going in there. I am not going to throw away or keep around, refreeze eight ounces of, of spinach because I'll never use it. So we're just going to have to eat it. And some basil, fresh, fresh basil. That's a lot, it's okay, it's gonna be delicious. Now get in there with your hands again, and I'll show you, what the, show you what this looks like. It's very colorful, and even though we have not added any heat, it smells delicious. Okay, and by the way, if you are making this for, I mean, obviously for this recipe, but my goodness, you could put it on pizza, you can put it on potatoes, you can, uh, put it in a, uh, a shoot on a, on a veg burger. I don't know this and it will stick around in the refrigerator in a sealed container for up to two weeks, by the way. Um, but I usually make more than I need because I will use it in other places during, you know, those two weeks. And that's what this looks like. You know, we normally, I would Refrigerate that for a little bit, let the flavors bloom and develop, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to put it back there behind me. All right, the bechamel. Now, we're going to talk about onions for a second. Yes, yes. Let's talk about how one should perhaps cut an onion. Let's get our onion out. Hey, the, the, uh, Karen, the Crocs want to know when your next virtual class is and if you could use fresh spinach. You can use fresh spinach. I would encourage you to already chop it, pre-chop it, because you don't need the strings coming out. Um, and the next virtual class is on the 12th. Thanks for asking. It's our um, top 10 plant-based basics class coming up on the 12th, virtually. Okay. Onion, any onion, doesn't matter what color. Take your knife, right, pinch, pinch. And you're gonna cut off one of the ends, doesn't matter which one of the ends. Now you have that flat surface and you are safer. Wait, AJ, I just even forgot. What did you say this was? When you have a flat? Oh, a stabilizing cut, it's, it, it, yeah. And it works great for melons, like if you're cutting a watermelon or a cantaloupe, but you know. And yeah, anything round, right? Yeah, anything round. You don't. Or a lot. <laughs> okay, we have our, our stabilization. And now you're just going to cut all the way through. See, you got to really use the knife the way I'm teaching you. Okay, now what we're going to do here is take away, you know how this goes, take off the outermost layer. Now, here's the thing, and I think I've run across a lot of people who actually do cut onions this way. Uh, we just kind of do it in different, um, different steps. Now, what I'm gonna do is take, I have our onion here, and uh, the largest flat surface is down on, on your surface, uh, or on your cutting board, I should say. You're gonna take your knife, and you're, we're not gonna cut all the way to the top, but we are, gonna, we are gonna cut all the way down to the cutting board. And I'm going to make slices. These are, you know, these are pretty large because ultimately it's just gonna go into our blender. These are probably half inches, okay? Now we're gonna cut in there, and in there really hold on to that little onion, right? I have two slices in there. Now I'm gonna go perpendicular to our top slices and we have and kind of a rough chop. They're somewhat uniform, but again, I'm not, I'm not becoming, you know, my OCD is to the side right now because I know that these do not need to be super, super uh, uniform. We are just going to give them a little saute 
and then throw them in our blender for our white sauce or bechamel sauce. Bechamel sauce, uh, by the way, is a mother sauce that was invented with four other sauces in the 19th century. Okay, name them. I know one of them's hollandaise. Hollandaise, and I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember me either. I just remember that hollandaise is Somebody one of them. Else. Somebody will tell us. Right, well, some of the smart people watching will be able yeah. to post the other three mother sauces. There has to be a tomato base in there. Okay, so we have our roughly chopped onion. Now, because I don't use any, uh, any oil, we're going to do a dry saute and some people do it a wet saute or a, um, a broth saute. And I don't really like to do those because it's more like steaming the vegetables and I really like concentrated flavors, really big, bold flavors. So what we're gonna do here is I'm going to pull the heat up on my skillet all the way. Now here's what's happening. Here's the science behind this. We're, what we're doing is creating a nonstick surface without using any oil. So when you have a pan or whatever, uh, and there's no heat under it yet. The molecules of that pan, the surface of the pan, actually the entire pan, the molecules are doing nothing. They're stabilized, there's nothing happening. But when you add heat to the bottom of that surface, the molecules on the surface of that pan start to shake and shimmy and talk to one another really fast. The higher the heat, the faster they start to shake and shimmy. And eventually they start to expand and contract, expand and contract. Now, if you put your food on the surface of that pan, when the molecules are still working their way up to high heat, it's going to hold on to the food and you're gonna get that stickage that you don't want. So that's why we put oil in there to create that buffer. And then you can walk away and get on your phone and text your friends or look at your Instagram feed. Uh -uh, don't do that. Doing a dry saute is really a great exercise in mindful cooking. You wanna make sure that you stay on top of it. You don't need to be a slave over your food for the entire cooking process. But during this first step, you really wanna make sure you know what's going on in here. So when the molecules are as high heat, at the highest heat they possibly can be, they'll all be dancing together, creating a nonstick cooking surface. Well, if you can't see it with the naked eye, what are you gonna do? You're gonna test it. Put that heat up. There's All right, two. I looked. I, I looked it up. The five mother sauces we have: okay. bechamel and hollandaise, uh, something called es, espagnoli, espagnoli, a thickened brown stock, classic tomato sauce with roux and velouté. So actually, two of those I never even heard of. Okay, so we need to make recipes with those. Nice. I'm gonna... <laughs> Here, okay. So what you're gonna do? is you're going to test to make sure you are at the highest heat. And the way you do that is have a little bit of water. And if I'm going to actually put this up higher because we're not there. Um, you want the water to not fizzle up and, and sizzle up. You want it to move around. You want it to move around the surface of your pan like a ball of mercury. That will indicate that you're at the highest heat and you've created a nonstick cooking surface. So that was, that's one of the reasons you wanna have a little bit of water off to the side. I have an induction right here and this is becoming very hot. We've got a little bit of rolling around. And if you don't have time, some, some surfaces are gonna take a little bit more time because they're thicker. Um, some are thinner, and I have actually done this even in my lodge cookware at home, so cast iron cookware. I know this is a little bit newer cookware because this is a little bit newer place. Um, and it is not stick though. We've been using, I've been using it a lot. This also works in my 15, 15 and a half year cookware that I got when I was married. So try it at home, anything you got. Give it, a, give it a try. And it does take just a little bit. There we go, we've got some rolling around. Okay, it does take a little bit of practice, but just be patient because once you got it, you got it. Throw your onions in there. Now here's the thing. When you put your onions and carrots and whatever else the recipe calls for in there, you wanna make sure, because you're at a high heat right now, 
pull that heat down to a medium, medium high. So a cooking temperature. This is not a steak. We don't need to sear the vegetables. Now that said, it takes a minute or so for that heat to, to come down. And you might get a little bit of, of um, browning or a little bit of, of burning right away. That's okay. This is the other reason you wanna have that water. A tablespoon at a time, that's all you need. Remember, it's not a water saute, it's a dry saute. We're just doing this because it'll cool down the pan a little bit and you will also deglaze, which is just gonna add more flavor to those onions. And that's really what you want. So just keep everything moving around until your onions become nice and translucent. And here's another thing. I love caramelized onions. Love, 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 love caramelized onions. If you wanna do kind of a cheater's caramelized onion, add a little bit of salt and that will further pull out the remaining water from your onions and really condense the sugars to create this beautiful caramelization. So you don't have to be here for 45 minutes on a slow heat. And I mean, really that is the correct way to do it. But if you don't have the time and it's really not the main event to your dish, I wouldn't worry about it. All right, we've got some nice, this is cooking up nicely. Okay, so we're just gonna give that another minute or so. Oh, smells so good in here. AJ, I wish you were here. How does St. Louis, the country opens up, girl? <laughs> I was there once when I was little, my dad took me to see the arch. It's the arch, thank you for not calling it the ark. <laughs> oh, well it has an H in it, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. You know, I, every so often, you know, when you're out of town or whatever, people say, oh, St. Louis, isn't that where the Ark is? I said, well, almost, add an H, and you would be right. It's funny, the way people think about different cities. Okay. This is a really fresh onion. I'm just, my eyes are... My eyes are leaking. So AJ, let me, um, cause I've been watching as I can your shows. When did you start doing these? Oh boy, I can look it up exactly, you know, and it's a funny story that I didn't know I was broadcasting to everywhere on Facebook. Cause I, I don't, I just not very good with buttons. And I, I wanted to go to my group and I can tell you the exact day. The first day was March 21st with Dr. Nikki Davis. And I've been doing one to three shows a day. And let me tell you your show number. I had no idea this is, it's just been so much fun. You're number 374. He's 74. Yep. That's a lot of work. Yeah, but it's fun. I really, I, like I said, you know, uh, if I, even though I was traveling full time, I might have gotten to St. Louis, but maybe not unless there was a veg fest or a conference. I, I'm meeting so many more people than I ever would traveling and, and reaching. And I just love it because I meet, you know, I'm meeting great people and we get great content and I just, I love it so much. It's like a dream come true. Who knew? So oh. it's, it's, you know, my mom always used to say, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And I can't really do anything to change what's happening with the pandemic. So I just, this is, this is my, my little pandemic project and I'm loving it. And I'm hoping I can continue afterwards. What's been great, Karen, is a lot of people that would never give me the time of day actually have contacted me to be on the show because, you know, you know, it's like, like, uh, you know, people that, the the chopping at the bit people that like to speak it's like they they need a platform and so I I'm in for some people that I never would have connected with so thank you look at that look at that that is awesome I mean really truly making lemons out of this ill gross or lemonade out of ill gross lemon here um no you're right that's we went um it was always in our business plan too to go virtual um but you know I was still trying to get used to the space the physical space and then we closed down and I thought, uh oh, all right, well, next. And uh, I'm in the middle of, you know, getting overhead cameras and HD, this, that, and the other. I'm with you. I'm not a big techie person and it really kind of scares me, but onward, right? You know, you have to kind of go with the flow. So, um, well, you know, some, some people like Dr. McDougall are saying he's only, he's going to stay virtual, that he's had so much success with his 12 day program virtually that he doesn't even want to go back to doing it in person. Oh, wow. I mean, that's a big step. Yeah. So, 
And he's on the show tomorrow, by the way. Like, that's another one. Like, I've been like, he actually like says, can I be on your show? I'm like, yes, anytime. <laughs> you know, I don't bump. That's the one thing. I will never bump a guest for another guest. I just do another show. I, that's like a rule I have. I would never do that. I just think that's so wrong. That's a really nice thing because most people would just bump and say, see ya, you will figure it out. No, you know? I, I, that's, it's just, I, I just won't do that. And, uh, you know, sometimes people cancel, like, but, but I won't do that. But if, if, if they want to come on, I, it has to be now, then I'll do a different time, but I will not bump somebody for somebody else. It's just, it's just not right. I agree with you. It's not right. Thanks for being an example. Really. Yeah, it's just because, you know, I used to be in show business, so to speak. I've done some stuff and I just, I just, uh, just always would drive me crazy. Everybody's, you know, I, I, everybody is some, you know, I remember I used to do scenes with this actor in my class. His name was Sonny Schroyer, unless you're old enough to remember Dukes of Hazard. Uh, he course. played, he played Sheriff Enos Turk and he was such a lovely man. And, you know, he'd always say everybody's somebody and, you know, you don't treat people different or special because there are celebrities. And so everybody gets the same two bottles of vinegar for being on the show unless of course they live outside the united states and right now thomas can't ship oh that's awesome oh and by the way that reminds me i finally ordered from california balsamic well nice but you're still going to get two free samples and you might want to try some of his new flavors like ginger which isn't even a flavor yet but he's 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 testing it so uh, a question from sherry on what kind of induction burner you're using um, this one is called Mirage Cadet uh, by Volrath, V-O-L-L-R-A-T-H. It's pretty high. It's a heavy duty one. The other one that I use when I travel um, is the Ducks Top, D-U-X-T-O-P. And that's um, like when I do veg tests and things like outdoorsy things, that's the one I take with me because it's a little bit, it's not so powerful um and i know that so i, I cook to that but and it's also actually this duck's top also makes a really great just extra burner at home like especially if you're having parties or the holidays or something and you need an extra burner i like that duck's top one there's a question did you have a show on the food network did i no i didn't but <laughs> somebody else one of my who's now a friend oh. somebody else said that one time oh yeah i saw your food network that's so funny. Hey, I, this is an interesting question. I try not to take, you know, interrupt the guest, but I, I do have to comment on this because I, it, I'm using it as a teaching moment. There was a question, oh, sorry, it goes so fast. Uh, um, Green Being says, is that a lesson from The Tonight Show? That is so funny that you mentioned that because I was booked on The Tonight Show several times before I actually got on. I was bumped because I'm, I was a nobody. And, you know, if a celebrity took longer, they would bump me, which actually was great. Because every time I got bumped, I got paid like some ridiculous amount of money for whatever 1987 was like $1,500 just to sit in the green room. But wow. I remember the day that I ended up uh, being really on, it's like I, I, I had a commitment to take somebody for their chemotherapy. And I said, like, I mean, this was like, it was like the kind of thing, like, like, are you crazy? You're going to turn it down. And I'm like, I told, I, I gave my word, I'm taking him for his appointment and he has no one to take them. And, and then anyway, I still got on. So I do believe in like, I'm, I mean, I'm not perfect and I don't always do the right thing, but I do, you know, your word is your bond. And it's like, you know, what can you do? And the, the Crocs who are watching said they love their flavors of California balsamic too. It's just, it's so good. It's Hickory is now, you know, Hickory was number four, but now that it's like, it's moving up on the, on the ranks for me, the Hickory. I don't know why I love the barbecue one so much. Um, so, okay, that, what's in your, because I bought your sample pack. Yeah, those um, are my favorite. The curry, the teriyaki, the sweet heat, the uh, the hickory. Oh, God, I can't remember the, what he put for the fifth. What is my fifth favorite? I think the Italian, yeah, the seven herb Italian. Yeah. I think oh. those are my five favorite. Yeah. And he's always willing, he comes on the show once a month and does recipes. And he's like, he said, he's always willing to make a new flavor if he, if he can. Yeah. I think yeah. somebody suggested a beer balsamic. He wasn't able to, <laughs> to do that one. Um, I'm pretty excited for that ginger one, but also I have had several people in here before COVID um, who have talked about your sample pack and then have also talked about um, the, is it this, is it this, did you say smoky? Is it smokies in your sample pack? It's called no? hickory. Yeah, smoked hickory. It, it tastes like oh, barbecue okay. sauce. And I use it, I just mix it with, tomato paste and I make barbecue sauce. I just, I've been loving that one right now. I'm so excited for it. Um, I bought it like 
It's been a while. So, I mean, I know with COVID, like I get it, um, but I was hoping to have it by the time we did this so I could like show it to you, but um, no, I'm, I'm really excited for it. Yeah. Um, Dr. Greger likes the blazing habanero, which I like, but I can only use a drop or two because it's so spicy. Just a little bit. Yeah, he likes his spicy stuff. Because he's a spicy guy. <laughs> he is. <laughs> uh, Brittany Giroudi oh. says seven herb Italian was a favorite. Yeah, that one is, is straight up salad dressing. Brittany, I use that one for salad dressing. The other ones I use mostly on vegetables and grains and things like that. But I love it. And some of you might not know that Thomas actually took stand up comedy and he performed and he was fantastic. But he doesn't want to do it again. <laughs> is that who, who took stand up? Uh, Thomas Allen, he's not, he's, he's usually watching, he's not watching today, but he's the founder of California Balsamic. Right, 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 yeah, 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 got it, got it. Um, that's so funny. Um, when you make, when you make your salad dressings from the, um, the vinegars, do you mix anything or do you just use the vinegars? You know, depending on the flavor, Seven Herb Italian needs nothing in it at all, honestly. It's, it's, it yeah. tastes it like the best Italian dressing. He uses the herbs from another wonderful vendor called Local Spicery that are really quite oh. delicious. Okay, I cannot wait to get those and play around with them. I'll, I'll uh, tag you on some recipes that I create. Yeah, uh, nice. Let me guess, so us. Um, okay, so, um, oh, you know what I did wrong? No, I didn't, no, I'm not even gonna worry about it. Um, one cup of cashews. I did soak them, obviously, you know that we don't need to soak them, but I'm going to just in the effort of time so that we're not for very long soaked and drained raw cashews one cup uh that's most of an onion what the hell who cares um one and a half cups of vegetable stock ready to go and i'm not going to add all of the stock right now um because it may be thick enough so i don't want this to be too watery i always tell people when you're making any kind of anything liquidy um, and you're, or you're adding liquid to anything, really be conservative because it's easy to add more in, really difficult to take it back out. So be conservative with that. A little bit of dry white wine. It's about a fourth of a cup. You don't have to do it. You can do broth if you want, or you can just omit it completely and then add more broth if you feel like you need some more liquid in there. One garlic clove has been cut uh, you don't need to cut it because it's going into a blender, but I do like that. Those properties of Allison to really bloom, those are your cancer fighters. That happens after you cut onion and garlic. So if you see onions and garlic in a recipe, um, make sure that you cut those first and let them hang out to the side. Dr. Gregory likes to say hack and hold. Uh, let them sit for about five minutes and the Allison in them is a property that blooms and is a huge cancer fighter anti-inflammatory. I didn't do it with the onion because I wanted to show you how to cut an onion or how I like to cut an onion, but I already did that with the garlic. More nutritional yeast. Again, nectar, baby, nectar. That amount is up to you. And if you don't like nutritional yeast, just omit it. Onion granules. can use onion powder, but I like the granules. It's a little bit more robust of a flavor. Don't use onion salt for obvious reasons. And, oh, we use a nutmeg. This is white pepper. We're using white pepper. It's a little bit of a different flavor, a little bit more robust, um, I think. But also, this is a white sauce, so you want to use white pepper. And we are back to just our hint of the nutmeg. Sorry. Just a little baby bit. to the side and then we're going to whirl this puppy up. Um, I'm not going to add the salt. No reason for personal prep. Nice 
delicious. All right, so this will also thicken up as it cools down a little bit um, and it just hangs out. So that's why, you know, one reason we're not gonna use it right away, I want it to thicken up. I'm just gonna keep it right back here. Now we're gonna go ahead and make the red sauce, which is so easy. I, this is a red sauce, this is my own mother sauce. Um, I like to use this for pasta. Um, it's just kind of a go-to for me. And it's really pretty simple. My favorite tomato, AJ, tell me it's yours. The San Marzano, this. Oh, and my favorite is the brown kumata. Wait, wait, what? The kumata, K-U-M-A-T-O, the brown oh, kumata. Oh, oh. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I don't really use those. Now I have to give it a try with some of these recipes. I do love my San Marzanos now. But I do like the, if for canned tomatoes, I do like the Muir Glen Fire Roasted very much. Is that what, oh no, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I think I have a can of those in the back. Yeah, they, they're uh, harder to find in the stores these days, but I just buy them, you know, in bulk, just get them delivered. Yeah, and you like what you like, you know what you know. All right, yeah. all of the San Marzanos going in here and whole peeled tomatoes. Now I like the same Marzanos because they have a really thin skin. They're from Italy and they're a little bit lower in acid and higher in um, naturally occurring sugars. So if you're using just as I do um, this in all your sauces and uh, like chili, some people like to add some sugar or some syrup or some sweetener in their chili because they're so tomato heavy and there's a lot of acid in there. So you cut that acid with sugar or sweetness. With a San Marzano, you know, I mean, maybe you add some sugar, but really not a whole lot at all. Or sweetener, I should say sweetener. And do you find them in, in most stores? San Marzano's? Mm -hmm. Yeah, even Trader Joe's. I will check but, them out next time I go. Yeah, not in large quantities. And they're actually, you know, as Trader Joe's is so affordable, it's just really, um, it has, I mean, they have them, I think one or two different types of cans, but they're really affordable very affordable, <clears throat> pardon me. All right, so now we're gonna add one 14 ounce can of, you can use, um, what do I have here? Cause I use different things, diced tomatoes. Now these are diced and fire roasted tomatoes, but really whatever you'd like, Trader Joe's. A little bit of balsamic vinegar. Here, where'd you go, a balsamic? I don't know. Okay, I'll look for it down here. Aha! Uh -huh. A little bit of balsamic. I really kind of think that balsamic is the is the secret ingredient to this. And some dried oregano. And I'm going to use this whole thing because it's that's about what we're calling a half a tablespoon. Yeah. Now I'm going to wait on the sweetness. because we might be a-okay today. Okay, okay, and I like it a little chunky. A tasting spoon. Now, sometimes I get like a little back here, you know that tinge, um, and that's, That'll tell me a mm, little bit of sweetness, just a little bit, not a lot. But there's some extra acid happening there that I, I don't think is going to cook away. And then that's it. So we'll give this a taste. And it's smoother, it's gone. Yeah, so we're going to just use that as our tomato today. Get rid of all this business. And let's start assembling, huh? It's the fun part. Besides eating, you know. Okay. World's cutest dish. And since again, no oil, we're just gonna add that to the bottom of our dish. Add our, our tomato sauce to the bottom of the dish. Not too much, just enough to cover it. Put that off to the side. Put our cutting board back. And I'm going to take a few of our noodles. OK. 
Okay. Yeah. Our business. Our ricotta. Okay. Now, can you see this, AJ? I can, yes. Okay. All right. You want to take the smallest end, okay? So your smallest end near you. And grab just, you know, and this is, you'll get a hang of it. Just, I don't know, like golf ball-ish size of your ricotta mixture, your tofu mixture. And roll it, roll it, roll it, roll it, roll it. And now you have this cute little noodle. We'll make a few of these. And then I will actually put these in the oven. Now you want to make sure that uh, this, you know, you want to really make sure you cook your, your noodles or your eggplant um, pretty well because you want them to be, you don't want them to be stiff. So they'll be nice and flimsy for you. About how much time do we have? Because I don't want to take all. Oh no! Yeah, honestly, I, I I've got a I've got another one at two. So you got about two hours and five minutes. Oh, good heavens! But, awesome. but hopefully you'll get done sooner because I want to eat yeah. lunch. <laughs> but I mean, you know, there's yeah. no rush. I try always to leave a couple hours in between shows because it it's okay if it goes a little over or a little under. Well, thank you. Of course. Yeah, at first when I said, "Wow, she's only making one recipe," but I realized there's many steps to this recipe. Yeah, yeah. And I do have a. A little something while this is cooking. I'll sh I'll show you. It's super super simple, and um, something I actually just just thought of today. That I thought maybe you might appreciate. Okay. Well, I'll keep going just to fill our dish. I, you know, clearly we're not doing a a, a large one um, for time. I did make some more of our little noodles this morning. And I dare anybody to whoever's making this, and I really self-control is engaged at this point because we're on, on your show, AJ. Um, but typically I will be eating this off of my fingers because it's so darn delicious. It looks amazing. It, it really, it's just, it's kind of a, a little fancy dish that isn't really that fancy, you know? like. When I serve it at dinner parties, which I've done in the past, people are like, oh my gosh, so fancy. How'd you learn how to do this? And I'm like, please, <laughs> give me a break. Dinner parties, I don't remember. Those are those, those right. a long yeah. time ago in, in the timeline of human history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was that a dream? Did I dream that up? What's That's happening? Funny. Someday, AJ, someday. Yeah. All right, last one. And now I'm just going to put a little bit more sauce on the top. Yeah, you can see that I have a lot left over. So I'm going to be, after we conclude, I'll be making more and more batches of this and then giving it to, delivering it to friends and family. Okay, now, again, in the, in the um, effort of, you know, trying to stay somewhat on time, um, what I would typically do here is put this in the oven and let it bake until it boils uh, just a little bit and then pull it back out and put our bechamel on top. But uh, I will uh -huh. add now, and I've done this before, so it, I mean, you could do this too. Um, I'm just gonna add the bechamel now and let it all cook together. And then just with like, if you're making a pizza, um, what I typically do is pull this out, put some fresh basil on it, and um, then put stick it back in the oven just for a minute or so, just so that basil can cook down, but doesn't get so wilty or you can't even see it. So I'm gonna put this in right now. And we'll let that go for a few minutes. 
Now, <laughs> when I, I worked in corporate America, I actually worked in a, um, a medical practice for years and years. I was the marketing department. I was the only marketing person. I was the marketing girl. And um, I, ha I was new-ish to a plant-based diet. Um, but, you know, I only had an hour for lunch and I, I didn't like to really make my lunch at home. I just was, have never really been that person. I always have to get out during the day, even if it's just to the grocery store, which is what it was. Remember salad bars, talk about dinner party salad bars, right? So I would go to the salad bar every single day at our local um, grocery store. And I would make this huge salad and I didn't know how to make salad dressings and I didn't want to make them because I knew they're full of crap. But I didn't really want to make them and I was just like, mm, I don't know what to do. So one day I was, I was rifling through the refrigerator with everybody else's stuff, none of mine. And I thought, what can I use? What can I use? And I thought, mm, hot sauce. And I'm like, okay, I've done that before. No, I'm telling you what, if you are brand new to a plant-based diet and you have not yes, yet mastered the formula for making salad dressings, um, and there, I think that there's a formula. It's very simple. And we talk about it in, in our classes and stuff. Just plain old, uh, no, mustard makes a great salad dressing. And I know that that sounds crazy. I totally get it. If you don't like mustard, this is probably not for you. But I loved using mustard in my salads. Just mustard, just plain old mustard. So using my Holland bowl, by the way, I know that you did a show on the Holland bowl. Yeah, I, I love the Holland bowl. You know, I've, I've used mustard in dressing recipes, but never just straight up just straight up girl like it's just i mean i don't know what what it is about it i'm not like this big mustard freak i mean you might think i am because i use it just you know i use it like that but i really am not um i i just really enjoy using it as a salad dressing because you don't have to use a whole lot and i'm just going to cut up a little bit of purple cabbage a little bit goes a long long way this out give this a couple rough chops so today i just have some you know no big deal greens as you can see some romaine a little bit of endive and always a good crunch from our celery so just going to put this in our bowl cut up a little bit of a red onion give it some spice This is, I mean, this is quite literally, because I just thought about doing this today. Uh, this is quite literally a kitchen sink or use what's in the refrigerator salad. So this, you know, this is great for you. For the newbies, you don't have to get all fancy. Whatever you find in the fridge, whatever veggies you have in the fridge, cut them up. See how you like them. Give that a rough chop. Put that in our, our bowl. This bowl was a gift from a couple of girls um, when I opened up the shop last 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 august and uh they had it engraved in the bottom so sweet so sweet okay just some rough chops there with our our celery i love celery i'm really new to celery and salads because i've never been a really big sal uh, celery person I, I, for whatever reason i don't know and i um but having it in salads is a great way to get it in because it gives you that crunch without being too overwhelming if you don't like celery. And some super crunchy, super loud <laughs> romaine. Oh, oh, okay. A little bit here. So. Now, if you are, this is a great, I mean, I mean, I think you probably do this, AJ, and a lot of people do this. They just take your bowl and use, use your, what's this called? Is it called a Yulu? It's not called a Yulu. I think it's called a Mezzaloon. Mezzaloon. Thank you. Where did I get Yulu? Oh, Ulu is very similar. Ulu is the one, it's, it, it's from Alaska. It, it's very, very similar tool. Oh, okay. Got it. And then you just get in there and have a good time. Give it a few more. I mean, 
seriously. I mean, these things are so fun. I know this is an endorsement and I'm not being paid um, for the Hoffman Bowl Company, but what a great idea to do these, to market these, make these. And if anybody's gonna sell the heck out of them, it's gonna be our crazy plant-based community. So, because we have such a rich main event coming up, starting with a salad, filling up, AJ, this, I'm speaking your language, volumetrics, low cap mm -hmm. and high nutrients. We're gonna start off with this, and then we won't eat our way all the way through that entire dish of meat pie. Salads are just so much tastier when they're chopped, in my opinion. Oh, totally. We have a place in St. Louis. I don't know if you guys have this. Um, wait, are you in Phoenix? I'm, I'm in Indio, California, 21 miles east of Palm Springs. Oh, wait, how, why did I think you were in Arizona? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so I don't know if you guys have this in California, but we have a place called Crushed Red. And um, it's, it's like a full service salad bar, except people, you know, you tell people what you want and they put it in your bowl or whatever. And then using this, or actually it's a really big blade and they chop the salad and they chop everything that you, you know, you, you've um, asked for. And then they shake it with your dressing, whatever dressing you choose or not. And then you go to your table or you take it home or you do whatever, but it's called crushed reds and it's, it's like, I think they say it's crafted chopped salads or something. I don't know, but yes, to your point, they're great. I love, <laughs> I love chopped salads. It's, it's just the pieces are too big otherwise. And, and you get a better flavor profile when everything is kind of all mixed together and chopped in the same size. Totally. Yeah. And it's just not a good look when you're shoving lettuce in your face and it goes all over your cheeks. And the thing is, is you actually, you in general, we want to increase volume for if people want to lose weight, but with salads, we need to eat more of them. So this decreases the volume and, and you get to eat more. That's just, yeah, right. I mean, I will, I when we, you know, turn tune off today, I will eat this entire bowl, which I mean, to you, I know it's no big deal. Um, and, but, you know, this is as big as my head. And um, I don't know if I eat, what do you, what do you eat? Four pounds of food a day? Is that what you Oh, no, mean? I eat more than four pounds of food. I mean, uh, when I was losing weight, I was eating six to 10 pounds of food. I've, now that um, I've been in lean for almost 10 years, I'd say probably, I'd probably eat about just six pounds of food a day now. Yeah, yeah. Hey, heads of lettuce, they're, they're heavy. Oh my God, yeah, vegetables are like, it's like negative calories. It's so easy. Yeah. And especially like, you know, things like zucchini, two, two pounds in the air fryer, it's like a snack. Oh, that's delicious. Uh, okay, so... Then I'm just, I, I mean, I did pump up the, the heat to this. Um, is there anything that I, I mean, I could bring it out now and it would still be fine. Cause really when you're cooking plant-based, you're really not all the time. You're not cooking, you're just heating through. Um, but is there anything that anybody wants to know right now? Um, otherwise I'll just go ahead and pull out our, our manicotti. I'm looking to see if there's any questions. Da, da, da. Yep. A lot of people are concurring chopped salads are the best. And Jesse says celery is a very underrated vegetable. I agree, Jesse. And I think millet is an underrated grain. I think a lot of people don't even try it when it's absolutely delicious. Yeah, yeah. And that's actually great in, um, in chilies to replicate ground beef. Actually, I did that in my latest book, On Your Health. I, I have a, a legume-free version of a chili and I, I use millet. See, like mine's. Mandy says, my day is not complete without a salad at lunch. Jail says, how many sweet potatoes do you eat in a day? I don't know. I don't know by potatoes, I go by pounds. So I don't know, lunch is usually one and a half pounds. That's a serving. That's what I'll have for lunch is, is, is Japanese sweet potatoes and a chopped salad is today. Oh, Mary Jo says, can Karen tell us what she eats for, what she has for breakfast? And Chris says, would zucchini work as well as the eggplant? So yes, I think zucchini um, or yellow squash would work. You're just going to have, they're just going to be smaller. 
um, your cook times are going to be a lot less when you are pre-cooking your your noodles. So, and I don't have those times, but do do give that a try. Um, and breakfast, boy, I'll tell you, you know, sometimes I'm in the mood for breakfast, sometimes I'm not. Um, and you know, we're we just we're so ingrained that you know, a breakfast food has to be a breakfast food. Like it has to be a bagel or it has to be a bowl of cereal or it has to be, you know, a certain food group, you know, breaking, you're just breaking a fast, you're waking up. So whatever you feel like eating is fine. For example, this morning, and I was in a rush to get out of the house this morning, last night, my husband made a, um, a stir fry and I shoved a couple bites of that in, in my mouth before I hit the road. And I was fine with that. So whatever you want to eat in the morning is totally fine. It doesn't, your body doesn't really know, oh, it's breakfast. Okay, we've got our special K or grape nuts or whatever. I know, and it doesn't even have to be first thing in the morning. It could actually be when you actually feel hungry. That's exactly right. And that's why I, I always say I'm not always a breakfast person because sometimes I wake up and most days I you know, it's usually, it's usually lemon water just to get hydrated. And then if I'm hungry, then I'll eat. And sometimes I just won't, you're right, AJ. And then you get to half the day and you're like, well, shoot, I haven't eaten today. I should probably think about doing that. Um, but yeah, but, but if you are a breakfast person and you really want to stick by that breakfast rule or, or doctrine or whatever you would call it, um, you know, I, I have oats at home and sometimes I will make oatmeal with some blueberries and walnuts. Um, I, I really do like an egg scramble or a tofu scramble. That's something that lasts several days in the refrigerator. So um, like maybe on a Friday morning or a Saturday morning, I'll make it. My husband and I can eat it for the next couple of days. He's more of a breakfast person than I am. Um, but, you know, most days it's it's either nothing or last night's dinner or, you know, we always keep bananas. Maybe it's a banana, you know, but it's just not really a big thing for me. K in the K wants to know or wants you to tell people about your plant-based cooking show. Oh, thanks for asking. Um, so like you, AJ, I started the plant-based quarantine cooking show. Um, you started in March. I probably started in April. Um, and I just did two shows a week. And I use that word show loosely. Um, did those from our kitchen. And my husband was my makeshift floor director and producer. And um, I just made one, one dish, one recipe a couple of times a week. Um, and, and that really got, that really had some traction too, got some traction. So that was fun. And then when St. Louis started to open up a little bit more, um, I came back in the shop and I refocused that effort. And now I have the plant-based quick cooking show and that is pre-recorded and every recipe is seven ingredients or less and it comes out every Tuesday. It's really for the plant-based beginner because some people, a lot of people I've found, just want to tiptoe into this <clears throat> or perhaps they're not interested in being plant-based, they just want to add more plants to their plate. So if they have one new super easy recipe a week, that's just enough, that's all they need and it's not overwhelming. So the Center for Plant-Based Living has a YouTube channel and all of those shows are called the Plant-Based Quick Cooking Show, quick because it's seven ingredients or less. And again, it's every Tuesday they come out. And I don't know what number I'm on. It's not 374. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe 20, but there's a good little library that we started and I'm, like kind of pretty proud of it well I'm gonna I'm gonna link to it right now and and thank okay. you for mentioning that Brian I appreciate that that's wonderful to know about that yeah I that's very cool thanks and, and do you do it live or is it pre-recorded it's pre-recorded um I enjoy the live stuff but I really wanted to create a just kind of a it's really not that professional at all because you know I just do it here but I wanted to just have a little bit more control over the content I'm looking, I see a fancy pickled red onion without the cost. It's so delicious. Yeah, it looks, still, it, it looks great. Thanks. Yeah, I still have that in my fridge. I should have put that in the salad. 
so how, you know what I was thinking would be really fun is maybe to get you and Rachel together for a little iron chef and I could, I could run it. I can run it if, if you guys are in the same kitchen or different kitchens. Yes, we could, whatever's easiest for you, we could do it here or, you know, virtually that would be super fun. Now that I'll tell you, I mean, I'll do it, but that's intimidating because she's a super chef. She, that girl knows. Well, don't sell yourself off short. I think you're a super chef based on what I saw today. The only problem is who would judge it? I can't taste it through the computer. Yeah, we'd have to have somebody. So we'd have to have, we'd have to do it here and have somebody. That'd be great. But you know, the thing is, the thing that's really cool about Iron Chefs, and I did them for years in, in, you know, and with, with Chef, Chef Bravo, isn't even so much about who wins. It's about the process of creating something from whatever you have in the, in the refrigerator. So when I would run the Iron Chefs, I wouldn't pick weird ingredients to, I would pick things that when people come home from work and they found that there was a bell pepper in their refrigerator and you know, a half a can of beans, what are you going to make? Show me. And that's, that's what I think is about the process more important than the outcome. Isn't it so interesting to see how people think about things and what, I mean, yeah, if you gave us, I guess now, how would that work? You would give us the same ingredients. Yeah. Or or maybe, maybe what we could do is if you guys have spouses or people, I could contact them and say, please, you know, be honest. And I'd like you to get, and you can use anything in your pantry. Of course, it's just that you have to use the three ingredients in a significant way. So it's like, if it's partially, it can't, can't just be like a sprig. And I don't, I don't try to fool people. I try to think of things that people would really have. And then, then you would open the basket and then you'd have like 20 minutes for each course. One, you know, there's usually a dessert course or, or a savory course in a suite. It doesn't have to be dessert but that's how it's that's how I've done them they're really fun I love doing them I mean I love I I love uh, some of my best recipes that are in my books were created out of being thrown into an iron chef situation and is it really that isn't that when we do our best work absolutely that's when we can be the most creative when we're under the when uh, when we're under the gun yeah yeah, let's let's see if we can work that out that'd be fun because then it could open up the channel to a whole new experience i could pair up other chefs and other parts that have been guests on the show and or even you maybe i can put the you know jeruti family against crocs in the kitchen and do this i I would love to actually try to you know create things like that because that's yes 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 Let's do that. Okay. okay. It's, it's on my list. I'm, I'm, I'm not booking until the end of March, but this will be a really fun way to go. Maybe we can do it like once a week or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. project. So um, people are asking, do you ever use different types of mustards as your salad dressing? And Lisa wants to know, what do you usually put in your tofu scramble? Um, okay. So when I realized that I like mustard in my salads, yes, then every time, well, I would, finish a bottle eventually. And then because I was always in a grocery store, I would go over to the aisle and see what other kind of mustard I could use. So um, yes, I, in the past, I have used stone ground, sweet. uh, There's a, there's a hot, like a, I don't know if it's Tabasco or I haven't looked in a while, Um, you know, because I'm cooking so much now, I don't really use this anymore. I just wanted to grab it for today and for the newbies. This is a great thing. But yes, in the past, I have used other mustards. It's fun. It's, those flavors are so fun. Um, and then, sorry, what was the other one? Oh, oh uh, right. what do you put in your tofu scramble? Yeah, um, on my website, there is a recipe for a basic tofu scramble. And um, I, I'm thinking like rosemary, thyme, oregano, um, turmeric for the color, um, a little bit of cumin, S and P, salt and pepper, um, crystal yeast, and black Indian salt. AJ, you use that at all? I don't use any salt. I'm a boring person. I uh, know you're so boring. <laughs> um, well, I'm bo- my palate's boring, but I'm used to it now, and I like the way I eat. But but I hear that black salt tastes like eggs. Yes. So it's a volcanic salt, and it's from India, um, and it has that. That's where it gets that sulfur smell and it's uh, just like our nutmeg a little bit goes a long long way and it really does give that not taste of eggs it's that that smell and that aroma that really brings you back to oh yeah (laughs) these are eggs so I think that's everything I put in it oh and a little bit of um coconut aminos I think too but that's but that's on my website it's not a secret it's kind of a just a basic recipe 
So are you going to eat this now? I don't want to keep you from your lunch. I don't want to keep me from my lunch. <laughs> Let me grab my hot pads. And, um, oh, my trivet. Jim Loomis. Uh, I mean, you, do you know Jim Loomis, right? Gosh, why does that name sound so familiar? I think I have. Oh, it's a doctor, of course. Let him call him Jim. That's why. Dr. Loomis, oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. uh yeah, Jim is a good friend. He's also the medical director here at the Center for Plant-Based Living. And well, we got to get him on the show. He hasn't been on. No, you do need to get him on. Well, hook, he, hook me up. Hook me up. Okay, I will. He's an intuitive chef. He's really, really good in the kitchen. Um, he lives in D.C. He moved from St. Louis five years ago. Um, but when I opened up the center, I was like, hey, I need a doc. And he's like, okay, got it. So we, we create programs and classes together whenever he's in town. He was just in last week. Um, but he works with Neil Barnard. He's the medical director at the Barnard Medical Center. So he's, and he was in Game Changers. Yeah, so I remember. I do remember yeah. him in that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll hook you up with him. Oh my gosh. It smells. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you can. It's, it's boiling a little bit. That's exactly what I, this is when I would put the cheese or the bechamel on, but you can see that it's, it looks great just the way it is, you know? And then I'll just, I'm going to close this oven door and take the rest of our basil and I'm just going to put it on top. It'll, this is a very hot dish. It'll still wilt down a little bit, which is exactly what we want. All right. I have my big salad. And I would call this BAS. Can I say big ass salad? Yeah, big ass, I'll say it, big ass salad. That's okay. right. Or, or huge ass salad, either way. H I S. And then also our, now what am I, this is such a big, it's such a long recipe name. Eggplant manicotti with cashew bechamel. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, yummy. Get here, AJ. This is amazing. I need you to have this with me. And Can I'll you make send it, it to me? Now I'm really hungry. I'll make it SOS free when you're here. Thank or you. When... Yeah. Well, this, this was... has been amazing. You're just a, you're just a wonderful chef and an amazing person. I'm so happy to meet you. And I really was serious about getting you and Rachel back to cook to either together or again. I don't like that word against. I mean, it's a friendly competition. It's really yes. not, you know. Yeah, you know. no, it would be fun. It would be, oh, be great. Well, thank you so much, Karen. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have two shows. You do not want to miss part two of Dr. McDougall's lecture on protein, which will take place at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And then at the regular time at 11 a.m., we have Healthy Emmy. Thanks again so much, Karen. It was so nice to have you on the show. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.